Do you want to stay more focused on the right goals in your life or even just figure out what the right goals are for you? Do you want clarity? Do you want better work-life balance? Well, you're in the right place. Welcome to Success Through Failure. Welcome to the Success Through Failure podcast, the show that reveals failure as your path to success. You'll listen to intriguing interviews with some of the most successful people on the planet and learn how their failures became a launchpad for success and how yours can too. Here's your host, former Division I All-American wrestler, former Division I head coach, speaker, and personal coach, Jim Harshaw. Welcome to another episode of Success Through Failure. Today, I bring you Drew Manning. When I was a Division I All-American athlete, I was hyper-focused and I was able to take consistent action that allowed me to be one of the best in the country at what I did. Well, for years after I was done competing, I just struggled to stay focused on my goals day in and day out. I was easily distracted, so I wasn't able to stay consistent, the kind of consistency that you need to have to achieve goals that are meaningful to you. It was discouraging for me. I felt like I was just slipping kind of into mediocrity. Then, after interviewing some of the highest performers in the world, Olympians, CEOs, billionaires, best-selling authors, I discovered how they do it. I discovered 18 powerful and sometimes weird tactics that they use to stay focused at work, focused on the right things while also living a balanced life. And if you start using probably just three of these today, you're going to get more done in the next eight hours. I promise. This is not tomorrow, not next week. These will work today. I guarantee it. It's like magic, but they're real world solutions to it. People like you and me want the ability to stay focused, avoid distraction and be consistent. I use at least four of them every day and have used all of them at some point. And now I'm able to stay focused while I'm at work and get probably 50 to a hundred percent more done each day. I'm more present when I'm home with my wife and four kids. And the result is I have a stronger relationship with my family and I'm still able to achieve incredible goals like being selected to give a TEDx talk at one of the biggest TED events in the world, like launching a podcast and talking to A-list guests and running a half marathon, all of this while having a full-time job that includes frequent travel, working nights and weekends and all that good stuff. So you're going to find solutions on this list that are going to surprise you. Grab your copy of the 18 Tactics to Staying Focused at Work. Just go to jimharshawjr.com slash focus. That's jimharshawjr.com slash focus. Again, if his name sounds familiar, you may remember him from about 100 episodes ago, back in episode 53. Drew is the New York Times bestselling author of the book Fit to Fat to Fit. He's best known for his fit to fat to fit.com experiment that took the media by storm when his story went viral. He's been featured on shows such as Dr. Oz, Good Morning America, The Tonight Show with Jay Leno, uh, The View, and, and many others. And he's a certified personal trainer through his fit to fat to fit journey. And he's inspired thousands across the world to embrace a healthier lifestyle through some dramatic and that's uh, an understatement. Dramatic self-experimentations. His, uh, his experiment is now turned into a hit TV show called Fit to Fat to Fit, which airs on A&E. And as usual for the listener, if you don't have time to jot things down or you hear something you like, make sure you grab your free copy of The Action Plan. Just go to jimharshawjr.com slash action. Drew, welcome back to the show. Jim, thank you so much for having me, man. It's my pleasure to be back. Yeah, so I've been following you from afar, and for the listener, if uh, I would recommend going back to episode 53. Some great stuff came out of that conversation. I was actually looking back at the action plan from that episode, and there's just some really good nuggets in there. So you can get the action plan from both this episode and that episode back in episode 53. Uh, just go to jimharshawjr.com slash action. But Drew, why don't you give us a refresher? For those who haven't listened to that episode or, uh, or don't know who you are, give us a refresher, maybe a 30,000-foot view of your life, where you were, and kind of how you got into <laughs> doing what you're doing now. Yeah, sure. So like you said, most people know me from Fit to Fat to Fit, which is this crazy experiment that I did back in 2011, where I was this personal trainer who was I grew up my entire life in shape. You know, I grew up playing football and wrestling since I was a little kid. And so I never once struggled with my weight. 
And I intentionally gained 75 pounds in six months to better understand where my clients were coming from uh, so I could better relate to them and they could better relate to me. And it was by far one of the most humbling things I've ever done. It was way harder than I thought it would be. Uh, My eyes were open. I realized how wrong I was as a personal trainer when trying to help clients. And so um, anyways, luckily I did lose the weight. You know, I blogged and vlogged about my journey. Uh, You know, it went viral, went on a bunch of TV shows like you mentioned, wrote a book about it. The book became popular and and now it's turned into a, a TV show where, we, where we've had two seasons of, of me coaching other trainers through this process uh, instead of me <laughs> having to do it over and over again. I can only do it once, you guys. Um, <laughs> but instead, I've had other trainers come on and go through this process where they come out of it more empathetic, more respect, and a better understanding towards their clients who struggle with being overweight because I feel like there's a lot of misunderstanding and judgment that goes on. Uh, just seeing people who might be overweight thinking, oh, you're just lazy, you lack willpower, you lack discipline, it's easy for me, it should be easy for you, all you do is stop eating the junk food and you go to the gym. Anyways, it taught me a lot of valuable lessons. That's my story in a nutshell, but you can obviously go on, you know, Google it and to find out more information if you want. <laughs> yeah, and for the listener, definitely check out fit to fat to fit dot com, and I'll have the link to that in the action plan and the links to everything that we talk about here in the action plan, but it's absolutely fascinating and and if you see the the pictures of Drew during, you know, or when when he got fat and then and after before and after it's just it's fascinating what he did to his body to to have to to have this experiment do this, this experiment to show us what a typical American diet. And Drew, I mean, you were just eating real, I mean, pizza and pop tarts and soda and stuff that people normally eat, right? The regular American diet, right? Yeah, typical American diet of like lot cereal for breakfast with juice and toast, and then you know uh, a couple of peanut butter sandwiches on white bread for lunch, and uh, you know for dinner was white pasta with marinara sauce and meatballs, and then obviously a dessert at nighttime. You know maybe while watching The Biggest Loser or something, <laughs> and then <laughs> you know some snacks in between of like chips and cookies and crackers, and it's a typical American diet, and I couldn't believe how quickly I put on the weight. Um, and I think a lot of people as well couldn't believe how my body transformed in just six months time. Yeah. It's fascinating. It's a fascinating experiment. Why is that stuff so bad for us? I mean, we talked, you talked, you mentioned cereal and pasta. I mean, are these things really that, I mean, is this, is this what's causing this obesity em- epidemic in the United States? I think it, it's, it's part of the puzzle. There's, there's a lot of moving pieces to be honest with you, but I think it's, it's, a, it's definitely a piece and here's the thing, like we all have seen Super Size Me, the documentary where, you know, that guy Morgan Spurlock eats McDonald's for 30 days straight, right? <laughs> and he, he almost dies. I think most of us know fast food is unhealthy for us. The problem is that some of these foods are marketed to us as health foods, right? It might say all natural, gluten free. It might say, um, you know, fortified with vitamin A and vitamin D and there's this and that in there. And so we think, oh, it's not that bad. But the problem with it is it's it's cheap for one. The processed food is is very affordable, right? It's cheaper than you know whole food, and um, it tastes really good. I mean, don't get me wrong. I could throw down almost a whole box of cinnamon toast crunch because it <laughs> tastes so good. <laughs> That's the problem. Is the food's very addicting. So we're overfed but undernourished. So all these foods, we eat a lot of quantity of them, right? It's hard to just stop at just one small you know uh, bowl of cinnamon toast crunch, right? Or um, you know, chips, for example, you, it's so easy to overconsume these. And so that's the problem right there is we're, we're overfed, but undernourished. And so it's a huge part of the, the problem that we face with the obesity epidemic in this country. So even if we know that potato chips and cinnamon toast crunch are bad for us, why is it so dang hard to eat healthy? That's a good question. And it's, it's so individual. And this is this is where it's hard because I wish there was a one size fits all approach to helping people with food addiction. And this is one of the lessons that I learned from my journey was how real food addiction is, and that emotional connection to food is way stronger than I ever imagined. And I I only experienced it for six months, where I ate it every day for six months. Imagine people eating that way for six years or six decades, and now trying to change their habits, thinking, oh, the, this whole time this food has been bad for us. But we've been pitched that it, it, it's healthy for us. But the problem is that here's what happens in our bodies when we eat like cinnamon toast crunch and Mountain Dew and um, you know Pop Tarts and, and those kinds of things is we get a spike in blood sugar, which feels good to our body. It's almost like a high, right? It's like a this this high feeling that we get 
which is you know similar to drugs in a way. I'm not comparing drug, drug addiction to food addiction. I'm just saying it's similar where we get this high, but then with that high, we get a crash. And when we crash, we feel horrible. We feel miserable. And our body's telling us, hey, I like that feeling. Let's get that feeling back again. Boom, have a, a whole thing of Pringles and some, and some soda, and you feel good mm. again for a minute. And then you feel yeah. horrible and miserable, and it creates this vicious cycle. And then when you try and stop it, and this is something I learned as well when I try to stop it after the six months, is your body goes through these withdrawal symptoms of wanting that food again. And so this is the problem is that you, know, you wouldn't tell a drug addict like, hey, what's wrong with you? Just stop doing drugs. It's not that hard. You just stop doing it, right? Like we, we realize that that's a serious addiction. The problem with food addiction is that food is legal. <laughs> you see it every day at the grocery store. You see your friends eating it. You see people eating it. Um, you know, you see commercials for it. So it's, it's shoved in our face all the time. Um, and that's why it's so dang hard because it's socially acceptable to eat that food. You know, we say in moderation, but it's really hard to just say, okay, I'm just going to have this in moderation um, because it's, like I said, it's affordable convenient and it tastes really good so drew i brought you on to interview you for the show but this is really actually a pretty selfish reason that i brought you on the show <laughs> i want to figure mm-hmm. out i want to learn more about keto and I, I talk to a lot of people every day about the keto diet and i just a friend of mine just a, a month or so ago told me he's doing he's on the keto diet and i'm like real i'm like tell me all about it how's it going you know and He's got kids, and he's he's made it work for himself, and he's just shedding pounds. Um, I don't need to shed any pounds, but I want all of the benefits of of eating right. And I, I eat pretty good, you know. I'd say most of the day, usually until I get home, and then and then there's just uh, you know we've got four kids, and we got to put the food on the table that the kids are going to eat. Um, got a couple picky eaters in there, and so we just try to keep it simple, and and you know we eating cereal and spaghetti and these things that we know are are just not the best foods for us. And so, Drew, what I want to know, and I've talked to a bunch of listeners recently and what they want to know, we got some questions for you about keto, the benefits of it, why it works, how it works, and how we can get, how we can make it work for us. And I know that you've got a ton of resources on your website about this. So for the listener, we're going to talk about this a little bit, but but I'm just going to refer you back to Drew's website and all the resources he has there for, for the keto diet. Uh, but first, let's start with this, Drew. What is the keto diet? Yeah, so actually, the keto diet has been around since the 1920s, where doctors discovered that it helped kids uh, with drug-resistant epilepsy, right? So it helped with their control their seizures better than the medicine. And so it's been around for a while. But just recently, it's kind of emerged as this performance-enhancing diet for athletes and for fat loss and weight loss. But there's so much research on the ketogenic diet for other therapeutic applications like benefits with cancer or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or uh, traumatic brain injury. Um, And so there's a lot of research about it. But what it is in a nutshell is a high-fat, moderate-protein, low-carb diet that forces your body into a state of ketosis which is our body's backup system, so that if we stopped eating food today, for example, you wouldn't die. You might feel like you <laughs> like you might die, but you could go a long time because our body has this backup system where it starts burning our fat stores in our body for energy. So it breaks down the fatty acids in our liver, converts them to these things called ketones, and then ketones are then used for energy by your your brain, your muscles, and your organs to function, so that we, you know, like I said, we can go months, some of us, without any food and still survive. So a way to hack that, because not everybody's going to stop eating food, right? (laughs) A way to hack that is by eating that high fat, moderate protein, low carb diet, where it's about 70% of your calories are coming from fat, 25% or so from protein, and only 5% from carbohydrates. So you're shifting fuel sources from being a sugar burner to being a fat burner. Is is this a fad? I mean, we've heard about you know the Atkinson diet and then paleo. You just kind of hear about these fad diets out there. Is mm-hmm. this is this just another fad? I think it, it can be if it's only used or seen as weight loss. <laughs> I think the fad diets come and go for things like weight loss because you know people try it and they're like, oh, I lost so much weight. When in reality, the cool thing about the keto diet is there's so that has has so many legs of scientific research of legit studies 
showing the benefits of this diet, not just for fat loss or weight loss. That's what people need to understand. This isn't a diet for fat loss or weight loss. So for example, Jim, you mentioned that you know you don't need to lose any weight. And I didn't need to lose any weight either when I jumped on this you know, three and a half years ago. And the thing that I noticed the most with the keto diet was my body composition didn't really change. I was already pretty low body fat. My brain was so much sharper. My cognitive function and mental clarity was like night and day compared yeah. to before. And I went from eating six meals a day, you know, being taught that's what you're supposed to do to keep your metabolism going, to eating once or twice a day, but feeling so much more optimal, optimal uh, less inflammation in the body, better digestion, more mental clarity. And that's why I love keto is because my brain feels so much better running off of ketones. So as far as the weight loss thing goes, I think it can be a fad because that, that stuff always comes and goes. But for the other scientific research and therapeutic applications, like I mentioned before, there's a lot of new science showing the benefits of this diet outside of fat loss and weight loss. I bring stuff like this up to my wife. And I'll be honest, a lot of my clients are in the same boat. <laughs> like we bring this stuff, a lot, a lot of the guys that I coach, a lot of people I coach are guys, not not exclusively but a lot of them are in the same boat as me, right? They they love this stuff. They love just optimizing their life and optimizing their time. And and they bring stuff like this up to their wives. And just like I did recently about the keto diet, and my you know, just she just rolled her eyes at me like, hey, here we go again, Jim's on you know, another <laughs> one of these things, right? Yeah. And but you're saying there's there's research out there backing this up. This is not just some people who figured something out that might kind of work, but it's like there's research backing all this up, right? Yeah, so this is what sold me on it was I've heard about it before, but then, you know, like I said, about three or four years ago, I heard this doctor, Dr. Dominic D'Agostino, come on the Tim Ferriss podcast and blew me away with all the scientific research that had been done. He, here he was um, you know, out of uh, uh, USF, uh, Florida, and Tampa, and he, his research is being funded by the Department of Defense where he was working with Navy SEALs uh, who suffered from brain toxicity when they would go on these deep, um, deep dive, deep sea missions. Mm. Um, and so basically they, they realized that they could reduce that by, uh, helping them get into a state of ketosis by taking these things called exogenous ketones, which puts your body in a simulated version of ketosis where you have the neuroprotective benefits for your brain by taking, you know, these things in powder form and such. Uh, and so there, the, it was, it was, so his, his the military was looking into this, and so, anyways, there's there's a lot of other research out there. If you listen to podcasts, read some books, um, you know, go to PubMed and 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 find it. There's a lot out there if you if you want to look into it. So, okay, and for the listener, I'll have the link to that Tim Ferriss episode with Dominic D'Agostino. I'll put that yeah. in the the action plan, so you can grab that there. Um, so. If uh, well, actually, Doctor Oz, you were on the Doctor Oz show. Uh, I think more than once, a couple of times, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, and he he doesn't um, he doesn't recommend the keto diet. What? How, mm -hmm. how do you respond to that? And what are your thoughts on that? Tell us about that that conversation and uh, and your rebuttal to that. Yeah. So you know, Doctor Oz is a public figure, of course, and he you know his background of being a doctor is traditional medicine, and obviously. You know, you have to understand that doctors <clears throat> come from a place of, you know, decades of, of, of thinking a certain way. And we've all been taught, doctors included, that low fat was the way to go. Fat's bad for you. You know, eat low cholesterol food so ever since the, the 70s and 80s. But look at what's happened. You can't deny, you know, the trend in the obesity epi epidemic yeah. ever since we introduced low fat, sure. low cholesterol foods. And so it's hard for someone like a doctor to admit that maybe – you know, their science was not the best science to base these, uh, uh, these opinions on. And so it's, it's going to take a long time for people to kind of realize that we were teaching the wrong stuff and we had been lied to. Yeah. A couple of years ago, there was, a um, an NPR article in Huffington Post as well, where they showed these leaked documents of these doctors who were paid off by food, the food industry to lie about certain studies to show that fat was demonized to demonize fat so that these food companies could profit big off of these, you know, low fat foods. And, um, you know, th those emails were found. You can even put a link to that in the show notes. And like you, like I said, it's, it's not yeah. a conspiracy theory or anything like that. I promise I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but 
you know, there is some evidence of that. And so people like that. And, and just, did, just a quick note on that. <clears throat> so for the listener, in episode 24, I interviewed Carl Pills um, from I'm Too Busy for Nutrition. And he talk, he ref, he referenced a lot of the same stuff. So this is not just kind of one person thinking that this is this is, I mean, this is information that's out there. This is not conspiracy yeah. theory mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah. And so, anyways, getting back to Dr. Oz, it's going to be a slow, uh, it's going to be slow movement in that area, in my opinion. With you know doctors who were trained who had four weeks of nutritional training, you know, for, I think at the most <laughs> during their eight years of education. Um, to kind of accept this this new uh, research that's out there showing that fat isn't the enemy, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, it, it, here's the thing. I wrote a blog post about this recently to, with some links for people to print off to research and give to their doctors as well. So instead of just saying, hey, doctor. Can we get like, that? For, can I, I'm going to, I want to grab that. And for the listener, I'll grab that from Drew after the show and, and get that into the show notes too in the action plan. Yeah, because if you scroll down to the bottom of the blog, there's about 10 links with, uh, um, studies you can print off to look at yourself, present to your doctor and say, Perfect. Hey, should I look into this? Instead of you just coming like, Hey, I heard this podcast and I read this on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Doctors will be like, uh, yeah, that's not going to work. <laughs> but if you have legit, you know, uh, studies to show them, they're more willing to listen in my opinion. Yeah. Fascinating. All right. So for the listener, I'm going to have links to that in the, uh, in the action plan. So make sure you grab that. All right, Drew. So th- the results from me, I guess the impetus for me to actually consider this, and I'm not doing keto. I have not done it yet. I'd like yeah. to do it. Like I said, I've actually keep bumping into people lately who are doing it. And I'm like, really? I'm like, you're on keto? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, how's it going? And how do you do it? And how do you avoid all the temptations around you? And, and, and this and that. And <laughs> I mean, first of all, the results that I'm hearing from them speak for themselves. I mean, that's the biggest thing, factor for me is like, these are people that I know Yep. And some of them, you know, the one guy he he was overweight and fe- felt like he needed to lose some weight, and that's why he did. He's doing it. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, well, I hear you also like you feel like you're just on rocket fuel, like you don't get that sort of afternoon slump and whatnot. And you can stay focused for longer. He's like, absolutely, it's amazing for that. And I've talked to a couple other people since who have said the same thing. So, mm. so, so talk mm. to people. You know, people who are on the keto diet. So, if the listener. You're the type of person like me, you're hungry for, you know, personal development, optimizing yourself and your life. So you know people. If you're in that world, if you're thinking like this, there are people who you know who are doing the keto diet. So so talk with them about it and and also check out some of these links that Drew just just recommended. So so Drew, I started so after I talked to my buddy, right? I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start cutting out <laughs> carbs out of my diet, right? I'm just gonna start yeah. minimizing carbs in my diet. And I've done it in just a lot of different areas. It's just simple. I just used to you know, stop eating crackers and, and start eating nuts and stuff like that instead. Just just kind of making some subtle shifts mm-hmm. like that. Um, one of the things that I've done is I put butter in my coffee in the morning now. Mm-hmm. And and it I, I can go out. I, usually I eat, I had a smoothie in the morning, I, like right away, first thing in the morning. Now I don't eat anything until about 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, mm-hmm. So that fat helps you feel full longer, right? Yes. Very it, fat is very satiating, and it's it's more calorie dense than carbohydrates and protein. Right, you're getting about nine calories per gram with the the added fat. Um, but here's the thing: is um, you know, eating fat doesn't get you into a state of ketosis. It's the lack of right. glucose, right? So, so you you know, you got to make sure you're reducing your carbohydrates to about thirty grams or less per day, right? And those are total carbs when you first start out, just to be safe. So thirty grams or less of total carbs is going to put you into a state of ketosis. So like how much is 30 grams? Uh, it depends on what, like that's like probably one slice of bread. Okay. All right. <laughs> but that's what you got to be smart about is, uh, most of those carbs should be coming from, you know, nutrient dense vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, spinach, kale, because 30 grams of broccoli versus 30 grams of pop tarts is like night and day. <laughs> 30 grams of broccoli is a lot, right? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, one pop tart might be 30 grams by itself. Right. So, so you got to be smart about that. Um, so yeah, that that's where you want your carbohydrates to come from, but you got to minimize them. Okay. So here's here's kind of the point where I've gotten to. I've I've gotten to the point where I will eat keto, and and so f- I guess from what I understand, it takes it may take days to actually get the glucose and the carbs out of your system, right? Until you can actually yeah. kick into ketosis. So it's not like you can just kind of. 
you know, skip breakfast in, in your in ketosis. So, so I'm, I'm aware of that. So I eat, I would say you pro- I'll probably eat keto up until, I don't know, some point in the afternoon. And then, and, and I'm embarrassed to even say this in front of Drew. If you guys see a picture of Drew, he's, he's jacked and he like, you know, he doesn't eat this stuff. I have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, Drew, in the afternoon. All right. So, yep. so I'm, you know, it's a terrible thing to eat and I'm eating, you know, great up until then salad and uh, fruit and uh, hard boiled eggs and things like that. And then, and then when I go home, it's, you know, there's always going to be some kind of carb for dinner. You know, we eat healthy mm-hmm. at home, but, you know, we eat a lot of chicken and a lot of broccoli and things like that. But, but inevitably we are just, there's, you know, there's spaghetti and whatever else, right? Pain, or, um, French, you know, fries or potatoes, things like that. And, yeah. uh, so if I go halfway, right, if let's say I increase my fat intake, for the first half of the day, right? I'm putting the butter mm-hmm. in my coffee. Maybe I'm eating bacon. I'm putting like extra blue cheese dressing on my salad. And I'm like, I've significantly increased my fat intake. Let's say I do that. Mm-hmm. But and then, uh, but I'm still eating the same amount of carbs. Is mm-hmm. that going to, is that like a double whammy? It's like two negatives <laughs> don't equal a positive. Like, or is it going to make it, is it going to make it even worse? Am I, you know, am I going to put on weight, right? <clears throat> that, that's a possibility because you got to think of it like a teeter totter. You got to switch fuel sources, right? So if you're, so for example, mo- most people's diet are kind of low to moderate fat, you know, uh, a good amount of protein and then high in carbs. And that's awesome if you're running off of glucose. But when you try and shift those two, you got to, you know, uh, switch that teeter totter so the other lever is up so fat is your main source of fuel carbohydrates got to be really low because the problem is if you have high fat and high carb right that's where a lot of the old studies were based off of showing that fat is bad for you when you eat the cheeseburger with the bun and the fries and the soda Uh, (laughs) right they fat got blamed for the unhealthy effects uh from that does that make sense yeah absolutely so So you can't really go halfway with it you can't. You're either in ketosis or you're out of ketosis. And it has to do with the 30 grams or less of carbohydrates. Some people that are really sedentary might need to keep it around 25 grams or less. But you, Jim, being active, you know, when you're first getting started, start out with 30 grams or, or less of total carbohydrates. And then, you know, 70, 70% of your fat, of your calories need to be coming from fat, about 25% from protein. And then from there, you know, it's, that's why it's important to track. When you first get started, mm-hmm. Maybe track for a week or two so you realize, oh my gosh, I'm eating 20% carbs and I'm eating only 50% fat and 30% protein. That's not going to get you into a state of ketosis. So if you're just kind of winging it, it's really hard to know where you're at in the beginning. So that's the thing is you got to be strict with ketosis for the first 30 to 60 days to realize, to understand if it's optimal for your body. And that's where you start to feel the mental clarity the improvement in cognitive function, better digestion. You're not as hungry as often. You can go most of the day without eating because the quickest way to get into ketosis, Jim, is by fasting. And that's why Mm -hmm. implementing intermittent fasting with the keto diet will get you into a state of ketosis a lot quicker. And there's a little transitionary period the first week or two where you might feel not so optimal. Brain fog, um, lack of energy, you know, you don't feel that mental clarity yet because you've been running off of of, uh, glucose for decades now, and now you're trying to yeah. tell your body, okay, no more glucose. Now we're going to shift over to ketones. Your body doesn't know how to yet, and so it's going to take a good, you know, two weeks or so to get uh, keto adapted. But then the longer you do it, your body starts to adjust, and then it's like, oh my gosh, this is jet fuel. Like I feel amazing. So just be patient with yourself. Give it, a, you know, a good two weeks before you start to feel more optimal. There's some hacks that you can do with making sure your electrolytes are balanced. So sodium potassium, magnesium. Um, I have all this information on my website, by the way, but mm-hmm. also, uh, you know, a lot of people are dehydrated when they first get into a state of ketosis because your body's not retaining as much water with the lack of, car- of carbohydrates. And so there's definitely some research you want to do before just jumping into it thinking, all right, bacon, butter and cheese all day and, and butter my coffee. And that's how you get into ketosis. There's a lot more that goes into it. So yeah. definitely I, I recommend doing your research first. So, Intermittent fasting, you mentioned that. Tell us about that. Yeah, so that's uh, basically where you schedule an eating window and a fasting window. And um, so most people, the most popular method is 16 hours of fasting, so <clears throat> followed by eight hours of eating. So you 
you know, uh, you wake up in the morning, you wait till noon to eat your first meal, and between noon and 8 p.m. are when you fit in your, you know, two, three meals, how many ever meals you want, and then you stop at 8 p.m., and then you fast the rest of the 16 hours of the day, and it that puts your body into a mild state of ketosis because you're going 16 hours without food, whereas most people, they eat first thing when they wake up, and they eat a few hours later, and then they eat again, 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 again. This is giving your body's digestive system a break finally, and so you, you'll have better digestion, uh, better nutrient absorption from the food that you eat, and um, like I said, pairing that with keto, the keto diet, is a, is a synergistic effect, so you get into ketosis quicker. And that sounds crazy. I mean, this this intermittent fasting. I mean, it's, it goes against everything that we've heard for years. Is eat you know five six meals a day. <laughs> yep. But Stan, you actually talk about the Tim Ferriss podcast when he had Stanley McChrystal, General Stanley McChrystal, on there. I think he eats. I think one meal a day, a day, right? Once yeah, a day, right? Day. Yeah. 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 I and mean, I've experimented with that as well, and I feel great on that. Uh, but I like to mix it up. You know, uh, sometimes I'll do two meals a day. Sometimes one meal a day. I've done couple uh, three-day fasts. I've done a four-day fast with no food. I've done a seven-day fast with no food, just water and electrolytes. And it's crazy because you think, you know, you're going to lose all your muscle, your body's going to shut down. But, you know, I can still function, be a dad, be an entrepreneur, travel, get stuff done. And I never would have (laughs) thought that I could go that long without food and and still function. So um, it's crazy what we have been taught to think. And then realizing that, oh, maybe that's not right, you know? And then you discover, and you're like, okay, I'm going to find out my own truth, something that works for me. So it's been really empowering to experiment like that. One of the things that holds me back, Drew, is the measuring, right? Is yep. tracking this. Like you talked about, you know, you got to be kind of specific about this, especially in the beginning. Any tips or tactics or hacks on keeping track of this stuff and, and measuring what we're putting into our body? Yeah, my fitness pal is probably the easiest. It's a free app. Uh, all the recipes are in there. It's pretty accurate. But honestly, if like that's too complicated for you, just start with carbohydrates. Thirty grams or less. Just look at the back of what you're eating. You know, look look it up online. Like how many carbs are in half an avocado? That's where my fitness pal comes in. Um, it just track carbohydrates to get started, and then from there, <clears throat> you know, maybe after you you get that part down. Then you track your protein, you know, you know, where's my protein levels at with the way I'm eating. And then from there you, you track your fat, but you know, you don't need to, it doesn't need to be like an all or nothing approach. Um, you can start out with just tracking carbs first to make it simple. And that should get you into a state of ketosis if you're tracking that. Yeah. And one of the things that my buddy Brian mentioned that, that is doing this is he had this all, he like did his research, like Drew's suggesting, did do your research in advance plan, have some food ready before you go into this so that, you know, so that you don't, you know, you got to set yourself up to win as you go into this. So yes, finding sort of easier ways to kind of, to kind of ease into this. What about sample meals? Any sample meals? Can you give us like a sample breakfast, lunch, and dinner that might be kind of simple for somebody who's, who's looking to get into this? Asking for a friend, of course, but (laughs) yeah. I'll give you a sample day really quick. Bulletproof coffee first thing in the morning is just coffee with MCT oil or coconut oil or butter, um, maybe a little bit of cinnamon. And then for lunch is something that's super easy. Like I'll do eggs and bacon and avocado. I mean that's the simplest, tastiest meal you can ever have. And then for yeah. dinner is maybe a couple grass-fed burgers with uh, avocado and cheese. And then I'll saute my vegetables, like cut up some broccoli or – or uh, uh, cauliflower and saute that in in butter. Add a lot of salt, like a lot of salt, and the food tastes good. It's easy to make, <laughs> and that's pretty much a typical day for me. And like I said, you feel full throughout the day. You're not going to lose muscle mass like people think, um, you know. And there's a lot of people that are good examples of that. Do you have some of this on your website? Any other sample meals and resources like this that we can go to? I have a full 60 day meal plan with 60 days of precise exact meals to walk you through this because here's the thing people need simplicity they need like all right what do i eat today boom so if you go to keto.fit2fit.com or you can put a link in the show notes that will give you access to my 60-day program that has literally worked for over a hundred thousand people that have downloaded that program so it's super easy super simple it's very basic it's it's like a starter guide uh, because keto can get complicated if you want to nerd out on it 
But I, I think for most people that are just getting started that have eaten carbs their whole life, they're like, okay, well, what do I eat? It'll walk you through what to eat every single day for 60 days. Cool. So, Drew, I've got a sweet tooth. Mm-hmm. Any is that a deal breaker for somebody who likes to have their dessert, likes to have something yeah. sweet after a meal? Help me out here. Yeah. So that's that's the cool thing about the society we live in now is like there's so many companies now that have keto cookies and keto fat bombs, and you go on Pinterest and type in keto desserts, you'll have millions of options out there because there are sweeteners that are approved. Uh, and there are hacks, you know, of of keto desserts that taste really good. Now they're not going to be exactly the same as like the white flour and white sugar stuff, but it's similar. And, and I promise you, it's it's really good. And so here's uh, here's the thing: if you um, go to Pinterest, for example, or if you go to my my keto website, it'll tell you which sweeteners are approved. And the ones that I found that work the best are things like stevia, monk fruit, erythritol. Um, those are kind of like the safe. Uh, natural sweeteners that you can use. I try and avoid like sucralose or aspartame because although technically those are or can be keto for some people, those are you know have been shown to kind of be harmful within the body, and so I kind of stay away from the artificial ones as much as possible. But there's a lot of great recipes, and I have some in my six day program as well for keto desserts, keto fat bombs, and there now there's companies that will ship you know their keto cookies to you. The problem is that you can still overdo it on those. <laughs> so they're not like eat keto cookies all day and you'll you'll lose you'll lose all the weight, but um they do taste good and they are a good as substitute. Drew, you have two daughters. Are they on key are they on the keto diet? <laughs> no, I, mean, I don't I don't make it that strict with them, but I do give them good healthy fats. Um I get, I, I don't have them on any type of strict protocol other than that they eat the foods that I eat. But at the same time, you know, I'll add in potatoes and sweet potatoes and sometimes some rice, um, you know, uh, but they eat a lot of fruit and they do eat other vegetables. Um, but yeah, I think for them, for their age, like, you know, to be on a strict protocol with diet is not healthy, um, in my opinion. So we like to have fun. And that's the same thing for me. Like, I'm not 100% strict, 100% strict all the time. I like to live a balanced lifestyle and have fun with my girls and eat birthday cake at their birthday party. Yeah. But there are, you know, maybe a couple times a year where I go for 30, 60, 90 day, you know, stints of like, okay, I'm going to be strict. I got this coming up. Like I had a triathlon last month and I wanted to, you know, do really well. And so I was kind of strict with my training and my diet. But with my girls, it's no, I don't think it's necessary to be that strict. And uh, one thing just popped into my head that my buddy Brian mentioned is you can tell you, there's uh, sticks, like just urine test sticks that you can buy at like CVS or any drugstore, right? That you can tell mm-hmm. if you're in ketosis or not? Yeah. And this is where it kind of gets into like that area of like you can nerd out on it if you want. But like <laughs> uh, the urine strips are not accurate. Uh, what they will tell you in the beginning is whether or not your body's producing ketones. But those are just the ketones that your body's getting rid of as waste. So after you get keto adapted, after the first week or two, you'll you'll see it won't show up on uh, those strips as much as they first did initially. And like I said, they're not very accurate. So the gold standard way of measuring is to buy a blood ketone meter, which you can buy on Amazon for like 20, 25 bucks. The strips are you know one to two dollars each. So if you want to just prick your finger like a like you would uh, like a glucose meter, but it's a blood ketone meter. That's the gold standard way to know whether or not you're in a state of ketosis. So I would recommend if you want to get you know serious about it, then uh, you know purchase a blood ketone meter on Amazon or something. Okay, awesome. That's uh, that's good. This is all a great primer for us, and uh, that might be the next level for us. So, okay. Drew, man, that's uh, that's okay. very helpful. Now I'm going to shift gears a little bit since the okay. last time you and I spoke. The, the title of the podcast was called Wrestling with Success. Yeah, I just had started out my first, I don't know, 30 or so episodes were just wrestlers. Actually, maybe more than that. You were episode 53. Um, but I might have been branching out a little bit at that point. But anyway, it was still called Wrestling with Success. And uh, now I call it Success Through Failure. And I didn't prop, prep you for this, Drew, but I, you, yeah. you share quite a bit with, with your audience and you're very genuine and authentic and vulnerable. And I always ask my guests to share... Share some, some, some time of experience of failure in their life where they've 
failed and uh, maybe have had uh, some level of self doubt or hopelessness that, hopelessness that comes along with that. And we look at a guy like you, Drew, who. I mean, you're you're a star. You know, you got your own freaking TV show, right? Uh, you're jacked. Uh, every guy who's listening to this wants to look like you. And uh, but but tell us about tell us about a time maybe when it wasn't so easy for you, a time when you failed, uh, and, and how you worked through that, and how you got to where you're at now. I'd love to. Uh, hopefully, no one minds me being an open book because I am an open book, and I truly embrace vulnerability as a strength even though I saw it as weakness growing up with the, my perception of the culture I grew up in. So for everybody listening, you know, I, I have a podcast as well. And uh, if you want to, you know, listen to all the details, uh, episode 100 on my podcast gets into this. But I grab the, the link. Thing. That'll be in the action plan, too, for the listener. Awesome. So here's the thing. I grew up with a perception of from sports, from religion to my family upbringing, you know, never to talk about your weaknesses or your feelings and, you know, seeing vulnerability as a weakness. And so this this was good to a certain extent as far as teaching me discipline, but I kept everything inside, which eventually broke me as a man. And, uh, you know, being very religious growing up, you know, I had, uh, because of that, I hid a lot of my weaknesses from my family, my friends, even my spouse. And, uh, you know, I was married for 10 years. I've been divorced for about four years now. And when I was <laughs> going through some some troubles with her and and lying to her and breaking her trust and and uh, you know if you hear on my podcast I open up about uh, infidelity and uh, it broke me because I would hide it from her and uh, basically what happened in a nutshell was this was I didn't want to be seen as a failure and this was all during the time of Fit to Bad Fit when we were on TV shows like Dr Oz and Jay Leno and we had to pretend that we were this happily married couple. And, um, uh, I wanted to not get divorced and I tried to prove to her that I could change. And, uh, that was my mentality. And, um, but still like I, uh, I, I, I fought for prideful reasons for our marriage, uh, because I didn't want to be seen as a failure by the world. And so once I learned how to love myself, which this happened through a lot of stuff, addiction, recovery, life coach, books, meditation, years of this to get to a place where I finally truly loved myself and I didn't define myself by my past and I owned my story and I embraced vulnerability as a strength. I came out of it <laughs> such a happier person. So even though, you know, you can look back and say, you know, if, uh, divorce is a failure, it, you know, it depends on your perception. But for me, that needed to happen in order for me to, to, love myself, embrace vulnerability as a strength and be authentically me instead of pretending to be someone that I wasn't. And so now I'm in a place that I never imagined I would be 10 years ago. <laughs> I never would have thought, you know, I'm, uh, you know, where I am today, which is, you know, I'm not very religious. I'm very spiritual. Um, and I am divorced, a single dad, two beautiful daughters, and I've never been happier in my life. And like I said, I own my story. I embrace a vulnerability as a strength. And that definitely could have been seen as a failure, but I see it as a stepping stone to get me to where I needed to be today. And um, so in my, in my opinion, don't be afraid to fail. Um, you know, life doesn't happen uh, to you. It happens for you. And if you can look at your life that way of life happening for you, like what am I supposed to learn from this lesson? How can I grow instead of why me? Like why did God make me go through this? then I feel like we can progress and move forward in life. But if we're living in the past and we're always worrying about the future, we're never truly present in the moment, which means we're never truly living. And so that's, you know, uh, that's a, a long answer. <laughs> but if, like I said, if you want to go listen to my episode, learn more about me, episode 100 goes into it in more detail and you can see it from, from a different perspective. Drew, your authenticity, authenticity, and just being genuine, just really pouring pouring your heart out into everything that you do is what attracts people to you, and and uh, and um, it's just incredible. Drew's story is amazing. I encourage everybody to go to listen to episode one hundred, um, and uh, and just really start start following Drew more th for for more than just learning about how to eat right and how to be fed. It's just. Uh, it's it's so much bigger than that. Everything that Drew's doing and his impact on the world is so much bigger than just just food and diet and nutrition. So, Drew, thank you for that. Thanks, Jim, for having me on and let me talk about that. So, so before we go, let's just get one action item from you. So, for the listener who says, "Okay, 
I, I buy into this. This is sounds great. Uh, I want to test this out. What would be what would be the next action item? Let's say in the next twenty four to forty eight hours that that they can take. As far as keto goes, as far as keto, sorry. yeah. Sorry. Okay, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, on my podcast, uh, I have Dr. Dominic Diagostino on. I can't remember what episode number. I think thirty one. But okay, we'll find you it. Can, yep, there's also that that Tim Ferriss podcast with Dr. Dom as well. There's a book called Keto Clarity uh, by Jimmy Moore, which is a great starting point if you want to learn about what ketosis is. Um, and yeah, podcasts and books are the great are the first place to get started. But then also the link to my six day program as well, which is very basic. It's it's not long to get started, so that's where I would send people. Excellent. So I'll have links to everything that Drew just mentioned there in the action plan. Go to jimharshawjr. dot com slash action. Drew, thank you so much for making time to come on the show again. Okay, thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. And for the listener, until next time, take the time to get clear on your goals and embrace failure as a stepping stone on your path to success.